for our fish and bird um, position that's joint between ED and height. Um, and for candidate today is Holly Kinsbotter. She got her bachelor's from UC Santa Cruz and then her PhD from Yale where she worked with Suzanne Alonzo. And then she did postdoc at Yale and British Columbia before doing an NSF math bio postdoc at Simon Fraser and UC Santa Cruz. She's currently a visiting assistant professor at Rutgers. Um, she surprisingly has a very impressive CV. Um, so she has publications in MNAT, Prop C, Evolution, among other journals. And she just heard on Tuesday that she's getting an NSF grant funded. So she's really happy right now. <laughs> 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 and then just remember to have your mic on. Yeah, thanks. Can everyone hear me okay? Mic's on? No? It's on. I'm going to move it up. Okay, how's that? Better. Okay. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to come and talk about my research on fishes with you. It really is an honor and a privilege to give a talk here to this department. Okay, so I study the ecology and evolution of fishes and particularly their life histories. So fish have tremendous diversity in life histories. Um, most of them produce hundreds if not thousands of tiny offspring like both of the species in this photograph, despite the fact that they have wildly different adult body sizes. But then we have fish that only produce a few large offspring at a time, like most elasmobranchs. Okay, fish are known for their kinky mating systems, but most of them have separate sexes. However, we have also simultaneous and sequential hermaphrodites, and there are some e even some fish that forego uh, cross-fertilization and they reproduce parthenogenetically. Most fish reproduce multiple times over their lifetime, but then we have the evolution of this extreme similar parity in lineages like the Pacific salmon, where they have this um, iconic Big Bang reproduction, which is really spectacular. If you haven't seen it, I urge you to go check it out. And finally, most fish have indeterminate growth, but not all of them. Our faithful Danny O here is a determinate grower, so after sexual maturity, uh, body size pretty much plateaus. In fish with indeterminate growth, we have a unique situation for vertebrates, where there are individuals of varying sizes and ages that are reproducing in the same population. And this is something that we're going to talk a lot about today, because I think it's pretty important when we're trying to understand fish life history diversity. So like I said, I'm an ev evolutionary ecologist, and my research broadly on, is on how complex life histories evolve, how we can connect variation in life history traits to understanding population dynamics, and when that is relevant for conservation and management. And finally, I'm interested in broadening my research to understand the link between life histories and mating systems, and potentially how that could be influencing evolutionary dynamics like speciation. Before I go any farther, I have to acknowledge my tremendous collaborators. I would not be here without them. And also the many wonderful students that I've worked with, undergrad and graduate students. Again, they've all made an essential contribution to the research I'm presenting today. And finally, of course, my funding sources have kept me going and will continue to do so at least for a little while. So. Um, today I'm going to talk about three research projects that I have in progress and that I probably would be very interested in developing further given the opportunity here in Michigan. The first one, we're going to give an example of how I understand how diverse life histories evolve using the case of summer parity and large eggs, which have appeared to have co-evolved in Pacific salmon. We're then going to talk about a project I have on using life history theory to inform the conservation and management of data poor fishes, such as groupers like this one, and finally, we'll talk about this preliminary ideas that I have, understanding how life history traits and mating systems can potentially influence diversification. And I want to make time to talk about this research because um, while I've been studying these questions in a radiation of Mediterranean wrasses, there's a lot of convergence with mating systems that are local, like those in sunfishes. So um, that's, a, that's an opportunity that I'm pretty excited about. Okay. So in case you don't know, 
Salmonids have tremendous diversity in their life histories. And um, that includes both the number of times that they repeat their life cycle, which starts in fresh water and um, is carried out in the ocean. So in semilparous species, they only make this circuit once. And in iteroparous species, it can happen one or more times. But within trout, char, and salmon, we see a huge amount of variation in the amount of time that various populations or species spend in each stage of this life cycle. Okay, so some species go to sea pretty much immediately after birth. Some wait in the stream for years before they make that first migration out to a sea or, or to a lake. So when we're trying to understand this kind of life history diversity, we have a canon of life history theory that we can rely on um, to make predictions about how this type of variation evolves. However, that canon, I'm going to make the argument, falls short when it comes to cases like this because it's not able to explain some of the really clear striking patterns that we see in groups like this. Okay. <clears throat> so one reason salmon are so interesting is because um, of this transition to semel parity. So here I'm showing you a subset of species in the family Salmonidate. These are the species that are in the data set I'm about to show you. And um, if you're familiar with Salmonids, you'll notice there are some key players missing from this phylogeny, but we'll talk about those um, at the end. Okay. So we're pretty sure that some parity evolved in the ancestor to Oncorhynchus. And we think it was when um, this ancestor invaded the long, steep rivers of Western North America. So we see a correlation between the transition to semel parity and geography here. Unfortunately, we only have one transition in this clade, which makes our life kind of difficult to actually do a, a really great uh, comparative analysis of this trait. That being said, we have a lot of data on salmon. Salmon are among the best studied fishes in the world. So what we do know is that there are some interesting things about salmon life histories that don't fit classic theory. So the first pattern, the one that I was initially interested in, is this fact that eggs, salmonid eggs, get bigger with age. And age and size are correlated in these iteroparous species. The second one is semilparous eggs are huge. They're just huge. So this is, this is a pattern that was noticed. People have noticed this. They've known about it for a long time. And they've published various experimental and uh, theoretical work on trying to understand it. But we were, we're really lacking a compelling hypothesis for why. And the reason this is so surprising is because of our classic theory on the evolution of offspring size. OK, so this canonical theory, which was introduced in 1974 by Smith and Fretwell, suggests that offspring fitness is an increasing concave function of size or maternal effort per offspring. So this means that we expect selection is going to maximize the offspring size where the female receives the greatest rate of return on her investment. So this is an economic argument um, used to suggest that maternal fitness is going to be greatest here where this tangent is steepest. And when we take the derivative of this function, we can see there's a clear peak. This theory has been hugely influential and successful in explaining a lot of offspring size evolution. And from this, we get a clear prediction that in a given environment where this function <coughs> describes offspring fitness, we expect that as the female increases her reproductive effort, she's going to invest her increased effort making more offspring of the same size. Okay, so we expect that selection is going to minimize variation among offspring in the same environment. From this, it also follows that we see an offspring among size and number among females uh, in different environments or uh, in different species. OK, so just to recap where we are, even in indeterminate growers, we have theories suggesting that offspring variation will be minimal in the same environment. In, but number of offspring will increase if the female is increasing her reproductive effort, for example, because she's growing bigger. If we combine this with our theory of the evolution of semel parity, we expect that a semel paris fish is going to have even more reproductive effort because they're not saving anything. They're not holding back to reproduce again. So this means that we expect maybe she'll put more into her clutch size. But still, we have 
We have no explanation for why she would vary. She would vary and would vary and off vary and offspring. Okay. So with this in mind, we set out to dig even deeper into the published literature on cell-mounted egg sizes. Okay, bearing in mind we only have that one transition, but what we do have is a lot of population level data. Previous studies had, had lumped all the variation among populations into one data point. Um, so we, were, we had the idea that maybe we could learn something if we used a mixed effects model where we, <coughs> we used species nested within genus as a random effect. Okay, so the first thing that I want you to notice right here is that this is maternal body length. This is a population mean. And this is the wet mass of the egg or offspring investment on the y-axis. Semilpara species in blue, iteroparis in red. The semilpara species always produce larger offspring virtually at any body size. Okay, so that's funny. When we look at our mixed effects model, the top model always has female body size semel parity, migration, and latitude. So migration is a factor in this model. And we know that latitude, we know that temperature affects offspring size too. The coefficient estimate for migration is negative. So what this means is that within semel paris populations, we've got a subset of sockeye salmon called kokanee that are actually resident in interior lakes in British Columbia and Alaska. Those fish are making bigger eggs for their body size than their migratory relatives. And within iteroparous populations, we've got brown trout that are resident in Norway. So salmon have all this diversity. So we can actually kind of start to see if these things can be teased apart. <coughs> so those resident brown trout are making larger eggs than their migratory cousins for the same body size. Okay, that's interesting. Look at this, egg number is virtually indistinguishable between semilparis and iteroparis salmonids. This result no one had really um, looked at in this detail. And we were, we kind of didn't know what to make of it at first. Of course these are log-log plots, so we do have a lot of variation here that we're not explaining, of course, that there's a huge amount of taxonomic diversity here. Nevertheless, at this point, um, I was interested in pursuing our, my hypothesis for where this is coming from a little further. Okay, specifically I wanted to know if migration is important. And that's because of some prior work I did on the evolution of the offspring size and number trade-off in live bearers. Okay, so I'm showing you here scans of museum specimens of live bearers. And what you're supposed to take away is that the female's body shape is really distorted by the 30 or so embryos she's carrying in here. These are sword tails, so they're live bearers. And when I was studying these sore tails, I was also trying to model the evolution of offspring size, um, where offspring size increases with maternal age. And suddenly I realized that because of that nonlinearity in the Smith and Fretwell function, the female is receiving nonlinear benefits, and we don't know much about the costs of investment in offspring size and number. So there, there's some kind of complexity in the fitness landscape here, such that the females maybe balancing things a little differently than I, my original um, understanding of the problem was. The female could be trading off her offspring investment, the way that she allocates her reproduction now against her future fitness. And that made me think about reproductive value. So reproductive value is this um, term that gets used a lot in, in a slightly confusing way. But basically what it is is your fewer future and current fitness at a given age. So for something like a mammal that senesces, we expect that reproductive value is going to decrease after maturity because the female's future fitness is gonna always be um, smaller in the future than it is now, right? What about something that doesn't senesce? What about something that replaces its soma and maybe even grows with age? Something like a coral or maybe a bamboo in this case, it's possible that reproductive value can increase after maturity. Okay, well, so fish don't replace their soma, but they also get bigger with age. So their reproductive value curve is gonna lie somewhere in between these two lines, but we have no idea where. However, I thought this was a useful framework for possibly understanding, oh, these are the traits that are important for determining this line. 
So I thought this could be useful for understanding if the cost of reproduction, which for salmon involves a migration, possibly transitioning from the marine environment back to fresh water, swimming upstream, leaping up waterfalls. If this changes her reproductive value, leading possibly to semal parity, if it could also be connected to that, that trade-off between offspring size and number that she's making. So I wanted to test this hypothesis in a model. <coughs> I wanted to use a matrix model um, because th these models are well understood in evolutionary ecology and they al it's also extremely convenient to calculate reproductive value for an organism with this life cycle. Okay, so I'm using the simplest possible model of iteroparity that I could come up with. I have two adult stages so the female can reproduce um, in the first stage or in the last stage or both. And in the model, I'm using the standard sort of Leslie matrix probabilities of survival um, to the next stage, and, but I'm modifying the fecundity function to keep track of both the number of offspring she produces and the fitness she receives from her allocation to eggs. So that f of x smith fretwell function. I'm also keeping track of the cost to her survival that she gets, um, that she pays because I think those could be important. All right, so when you're analyzing a matrix model, you can write down an equation for lifetime fitness and you can also calculate reproductive value. Then you can ask when a different egg size can invade. And that was this first paper. I then extended the model to ask in the same framework when semal parity is the EFSS. So I'm trying to link allocation to offspring size and number with this transition to semal parity. Okay, so the first result from the model relates to that smith fretwell function. This is before, this is just a conceptual result we got out of analyzing the model symbolically. There's a few different ways that the smith and fretwell function could lead to differences in the optimal offspring size. If there's different functions for different females, the optimum's gonna be different, okay? But take a look at the selection gradient uh, the females have around the optimum here. The shallower the curve is, the flatter her fitness function is. And that actually is really important to the result I'm about to show you. Okay. The next thing I got out of this model is that when eggs are more costly than number, eggs are more costly than number, and female future reproductive value or her potential is large, she's supposed to make smaller eggs. That's because she reduces egg size to maximize her chances of reproducing again. Okay. Finally, in this model, it's relatively easy to recapitulate the classic results of life history theory, which is that, yeah, if, if background mortality is really high, you should reproduce as soon as possible. Um, this is big bang reproduction. On the other hand, if reproduction is costly, but background mortality is low, meaning you have high survival, maybe at C, especially if there's a fitness benefit to waiting, like you have another year to grow, you can get the evolution of delayed semal parity. So this is an idea that has been kicking around for a long time, but people haven't really formalized it in this way. Okay, so now that we have this framework and we have some general <coughs> predictions, we can actually parameterize the life history functions that we know with data that we have from salmon. Okay, so we've got a growth curve relating size and fecundity to female age, and we actually have an estimate of the Smith and Fretwell function for Atlantic salmon, which are iteroparous. This is unbelievable. This re represents a huge amount of work done by Niall and Jeff at Dalhousie. And I couldn't believe it when I saw this paper come out. It's exactly what I needed. So by the way, notice how shallow this fun where this function is. No, uh, this, is the, this is the offspring fitness curve. They measured the proportion recaptured as a function of egg mass. And they did this like 13 times. So I'm only showing you one population. Okay. With these functions, we can now try to understand something about the parameters that we don't have data for, background survival or mortality, and the cost of reproduction. Okay, so 
I was evaluating a function that could vary from very steep uh, decreases in survival, re reproduction, or, or very, um, you know, concave, very, very slow at first uh, decreases. What this means is that basically we're ranging from difficult to benign migrations. So the first thing we do is solve for the ESS parity. And you can see that it makes perfect sense. Background survival is low, difficult migration, you should just re reproduce early. If it's a benign migration, you're likely to survive, you might as well try to reproduce again even though you probably won't make it. If your background survival is high and you receive some fitness benefit from staying at sea, you should have delayed similar parity. And of course, if you're just living the good life over here, you should be at a Paris. Okay, now using that same set of equations, I can solve for the optimal egg size. And what I want you to see is that here, when we go from similar parity to iteral parity, we see a little decrease in egg size, but not much. But the difference is much greater once we transition between delayed similar parity and iteral parity. Okay, these egg size results rely on the fact that eggs are more costly, potentially, than egg number. It, do it doesn't have to be a lot more costly. So, is that a thing? Do, does anyone know? This is around the same time I, my collaborators on this same project said to me, oh, you know, we've got data on egg size and egg number in the same populations in years with different flow. So in some years, females experience a lot more water coming at them when they migrate upstream. And in those years, they make smaller eggs. But they don't change their clutch size or their egg number at all. So that suggests to me two things. One, large eggs are a luxury item for these salmon. When they're stressed, they're making small eggs. Second, egg number is allocated at sea. This is something that fisheries biologists will tell you. And so maybe it's something about the developmental timing on egg number that has led to a constraint that explains this pattern between female body size and egg number where we see no difference between Semoparis and Iroparis species. So now I have a new hypothesis, which is that a developmental quirk could have led Pacific salmon into this funny life history pattern. Okay, so the purpose of this is to just give you an example showing how you can use theory to sharpen your hypotheses about what is going on when confronted with complex life histories. But this is not the end of this because there's a lot of loose ends out there. For one thing, we need to incorporate something about salmonid physiology, especially the cost of transition between saltwater and freshwater. I think everyone knows that those, that transition is osmotically stressful. So we don't know if it's just that single transition that's costly or if it's something about, say, the length of the migration that's actually more important. <clears throat> okay. In the future, I think this project needs to be extended in two ways. The first is that you can study the same questions in other species that have diadromous migrations. And around here, there's a great opportunity to do this in species that have been introduced to the Great Lakes, which are a landlocked system. So they, they, they can't make the same kind of journey that they did in their native range. Furthermore, you've got a lot of cool life histories here of diadromous fish, and this type of question has rarely been looked at for many of these species. Okay, and then finally, um, I need to tell you a little bit about steelhead or rainbow trout, which are missing from my data set. These guys are basically my holy grail right now. And the reason is that they are sister to the rest of Oncorhynchus, yet they are Iteroparis. So they are the facultatively Iteroparis Pacific Salmonid. They also have a large number of resident populations where they're called rainbow trout and many migratory uh, steelheads. Well, you know, you might ask me, why didn't you put data on egg size and steelhead in your original analysis? And the answer is that steelhead are threatened in most of their southern range, and they have hatcheries on almost every single river um, in California, Oregon, Alaska, and British Columbia. There are wild steelhead runs out there in their native range, um, but 
I was informed that it's not considered good practice these days to mess with the remaining iteroparasteel steelhead females while they're reproducing because there's a chance that they go back to sea and come back again. You know, okay, I can't argue with that. But if anyone here is an angler or, a, you know, a, a keen salmonid aficionado, you might know that you have plenty of steelhead around here in the Great Lakes. You have many hatcheries. And so that suggests to me that there's a chance to really understand those physiological differences um, in a more controlled experimental way. Okay, finally, I think this project could be funded um, in cooperation with a lot of local agencies here. And there's definitely potential to carry this further. That being said, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about my work related to the connection between life history evolution and conservation and management of data deficient or data poor species. Okay, this picture really represents the global intensity of fishing that's going on right now. This is a port on the South China Sea that was closed for, where the fishery was closed for three months, ostensibly to allow fish populations to recover. <coughs> this is the first day it was reopened. There are thousands of trawling boats here. So this just gives you an idea of the enormity of the problem. Okay, many species of high economic value <coughs> are being fished by fleets like these. And currently they are unassessed and unregulated. There are no catch limits on many um, of our most vulnerable marine fishes. This, this lack of data strongly hinders the, little, the few tools that we have to actually conserve fishes like these, um, such as international trade agreements like CITES. So I had the crazy idea that we could use our knowledge of life history and taxonomy in place of population data <coughs> to infer species status. Okay, obviously this is also an old idea in ecology. People have been trying to make the link between life history categories and population dynamics for a long time. This goes back to R and K selection, which has sort of been updated into fast and slow life histories. And a really fundamental contribution to this discussion was made by Wayne Miller and Rose in 92, where they came up with the idea that fish have a, actually a trifecta of life histories. Based on ecological traits like the variability of their environment and uh, life history traits like generation time and fecundity. If you're not familiar with this triangle, don't worry about it, but I need to acknowledge it because I'm going to take a page from Wayne Miller's book right now. Okay, so I'm actually interested in understanding how these life history categories evolve, not just grouping species. Because my premise is that if we understand how they evolve, we can actually make a prediction about their ability to withstand additional pressure from anthropomorphic activity like fishing, anthropogenic, sorry. All right, so I'm gonna change the axes here and look at life histories that vary in their juvenile mortality risk from low to high against adult mortality risk from low to high. Okay, so when juvenile mortality is high, we can infer that from the simple fact that these species produce thousands of tiny offspring. So the per offspring survival is gonna be low. Right away, we can categorize species according to adult body size into episodic and opportunistic species. Again, this is stealing a page straight from Weinmiller's book. Species that have low adult mortality are able to have late maturity and eventually reach large adult body sizes. These species tend to be in highly variable environments. They have, um, they have to wait a long time maybe for a successful recruitment year. <clears throat> These are species like grouper, cod, rockfishes, things like that. On the other hand, opportunistic species mature early. We can infer they have very high adult mortality. These species have a high population growth rate and can quickly capitalize on really good environmental conditions. So this connection between environment and forage fish like herring, anchovy, or sardines is, is well known. What about over here where we have lo both low juvenile and adult mortality? Well, here we are in the survivor quadrant where species have incredibly high offspring investment that improves the survival 
of their offspring, and they themselves have very good adult survival chances. So this is most el elasmobranchs. There are a few exceptions. Some elasmobranchs don't mature until 35 or 40 years of age. Okay. Then we have, and these are relatively rare in the fish uh, world, but they're not actually, you know, vanishingly rare. Think about things like guppies and swordtails and other life bearers, or things like seahorses that have this male pregnancy, an extended period of paternal care. Okay, these species have low juvenile mortality, so their offspring survive very well, but the adults actually get hammered. Seahorses tend to mature at less than a year of age, like maybe even four to five months. So once we have this framework, how can we link these quadrants or archetypal life histories to the compensatory capacity of the population. Okay, so what do I mean by compensatory capacity? Well, okay, the capacity of a population to compensate for fishing pressure. So in fisheries, this is an um, increasingly popular reference point that they call the spawning potential ratio, which is the productivity of the fish population divided by the productivity of the unfish population. So this is at, assuming the population is at a steady state. How much surplus productivity is there? It's really useful to use a ratio, but it's also very difficult to get at. This is something that's usually estimated statistically from data. Okay, so because it's a ratio, if it's near one, we can assume there's no effect of fishing. If it's near zero, things are pretty dire. Okay, so now instead of using a stage structured model to solve for equilibrial evolutionary dynamics like we did with the salmon, I'm going to simulate population dynamics in ecological time until the population reaches a steady state. This is a modeling approach that's extremely common in fisheries, but I'm co-opting it for my own purposes. Okay, in this deterministic framework, I'm parameterizing the species life history with available data on growth, fecundity, and age and maturation. I'm inferring that there's some kind of density dependent recruitment, which is what every fisheries assessment model does. And also mortality. I can get at mortality using information from related species and from my quadrant of life histories. So using this model, I can generate a population age distribution at the steady state. So you can see here, this is a long-lived species. Some individuals live up to 60 years. Most mature around age 10. When we assume size selective fishing one year after maturation, we can reach a new steady state, the fish steady state. <clears throat> so this has the effect of truncating population age structure. Despite the fact that we are dramatically reducing the population biomass, this, is, this would be considered to be a sustainable fishery because the population is able to replace itself. <coughs> I'm not maximizing yield, but I am sustainable. Okay, so now what I can do is just do exactly that for each of the, some of the um, extreme life history archetypes that I showed you in the quadrant. And I'm gonna calculate the compensatory capacity of each of those life histories um, by calculating the fish steady state productivity and comparing it to the unfish steady state. Okay, so when my, collaborators, when my collaborators and I did this analysis, we couldn't agree about which life history archetype would have the greatest compensatory capacity. But I can tell you that none of us thought it was gonna be the seahorse. Okay, seahorses were the first marine fishes ever to be protected under CITES in 2004. Blanket protection in seahorse trade. No other marine fish has this kind of protection except for sawfishes and manta rays. Those only happened last year. So the point I'm trying to make here is that we do not understand the regulation of marine populations well enough when we're making conservation decisions. We need to focus on species over here because they are much more vulnerable to fishing and overfishing. <coughs> if you want to eat sustainable seafood, try to find something 
in this category. I'm not advocating eating seahorses. I'm also not suggesting that seahorses shouldn't be protected because they have a very sensitive habitat. We know that. But it's just interesting to me that, that this is the way things are shaking out. Okay, so to summarize where I am with this project, compensatory capacity can be inferred from an evolutionary perspective on life history traits. The next step is to take this information and actually fit our data um, predicting demographic rates and things like compensatory capacity to time series. And with my collaborators, we pitched the idea that we would do this using state space modeling, which is a type of hierarchical Bayesian modeling where you fit the data to multiple time series at once. We had the light bulb that possibly it would be useful to fit related species of populations, maybe even related species in the same or similar environments that we knew shared characteristics. So this is where we can use, we can, we can use taxonomy to infer something about population dynamics of data poor species by looking at the dynamics of their data rich relatives. However, this is a lot of, this is a lot of smoke and mirrors. And <coughs> one thing that we realized that we, we could do even better if we had life history theory helping us inform our priors for the model parameters, the demographic rates. Okay, so that's my job. That's my contribution to this project. We sold this harebrained scheme to NSF and they bought it. Okay, so just to give you an idea of why, I'm showing you just a one figure we had in our proposal. And this is a simulated data set that we sampled ourselves to prove the efficacy of our method. So here I have a time series, a simulated time series of a data poor angel shark for which we observed with error at five points. We, uh, we compare that with a time series of a data rich species, little skate. And little skate is actually assessed by both the US and Canada. So we have much more information, although we're still observing the population dynamics with error. So when we use our high-powered HBM to fit these time series, you can see we do a pretty bad job when we're predicting the dynamics in the data poor population. The dynamics here are dominated by the other species in the, in the data set. However, when we add our life history archetype information or our priors, we can do something really amazing, which is this. This is basically, feel, it still feels like a dark art to me, but I'm getting there. <laughs> so I'm pretty excited about the potential to pursue that over the next three years. And I think that the method itself will have many applications beyond the data that we propose to fit. So finally, I'm gonna talk to you about the connection between life histories and mating systems, which has been a constant component of my research, but um, I'm not going to be able to talk about it with my prior research much today in this talk. But I do want to take the, the time to spend a few moments um, discussing where I think I might take this in the future because it has some really exciting local applications. Okay, so I'm interested in how mating system and life history traits could potentially be contributing to diversification. <coughs> This is because I started studying this wrasse that was endemic to the Mediterranean. It's actually part of a species flock that is sympatric at my field site. Also this field site of my PhD advisor who's worked there for about 20 years. Okay. This genus has incredibly elaborate mating behaviors where the males typically build a complex nest out of something like algae or maybe shells and he courts females and entices them to come over and spawn in the nest then defending the eggs for a few weeks until they hatch. Okay, the males in this slide all do some variation of this. But that's not the only type of social interactions that we see in this group. When you go out there in the water and spend time with them, you actually notice that these fish are up in each other's business. They are constantly interacting. They eat each other's eggs. They eat their conspecifics eggs. They frequently have alternative male mating tactics. They all have parental care, facultative sex change in a few species, egg cannibalism, and then there's the cleaning. 
So cleaning has evolved as an obligate lifestyle in two of them, but many of them are facultative cleaners. So you can see here there's a one species hanging in the water waiting to be cleaned. There's a cleaner female here and two other potential cleaners down here waiting for their turn. Okay, these are all in the same genus. To give you an idea of um, where these are in the greater wrasse and parrotfish uh, clade, we can see that they're right here. And we also can notice that their phylogeny is still a mess. That's what I want to show you here. These black circles are around 50% bootstrap support. The open circles are well-supported nodes, but those tend to be the, the allopatric lineages. The sympatric species at my field site are here. You can see they have no bootstrap support. Okay, so what the hell led to the diversification of this lineage? Radiations in fish typically are explained by some kind of ecological polymorphism in a trait like color or diet or depth. We usually expect some mechanism of reinforcement to be operating, usually geographic isolation, and where speciation is sympatric, it's female choice. By and large, people infer that female choice is operating to explain sympatric radiation in fishes because obviously allopatry uh, isn't, isn't going on here. That's great. For me, that's, a, that's nice to know about because I know that female choice is important in my wrasses because female choice is what leads to diversity in male mating systems. So when males have high skew in reproductive success, meaning that some males are experiencing really high mating success and some males get nothing, those are the conditions <coughs> that favor the evolution of the alternative mating types. Great. So it's c entirely possible that we could rely on female choice to reinforce divergence by generating assortative mating by ecological phenotype. On the other hand, when we have sneakers, which we do, sneaking impedes assortative mating and can even lead to hybridization. So this influential idea was actually published by Carl Hubbs when he was working in this very department okay, on sunfishes and other, other hybrid fish hybrids. So when I'm thinking about this apparent paradox, I also realized b that I have some data suggesting that other types of social interactions among males are contributing to male mating success. Okay, so males are basically nesting in close proximity to each other, despite the fact that they're also fighting and eating each other's eggs. So it would appear that there may be some kind of benefit or social interaction that's contributing to male nest placement and potentially nest mating success. So then I started to wonder what types of social interactions might be diversifying. Again, this is not a brand new idea, but there's very little theory looking at, <coughs> looking concretely at social traits and lineage divergence. So at this point, I'm confused enough that I'm ready to go back to my computer and do some more theory, trying to produce mechanistic links between life history and social systems, which I view as, as pretty much fundamentally intertwined, and diversifying selection. Okay, I am also planning to resolve the species relationships of those wrasses so that I can do eventual comparative tests, maybe using the entire wrasse tree. Fortunately, I have a very good collaborator to help me with this because um, I, I wouldn't be equipped to do it but um, he's enthusiastic and my samples are, are waiting for his students uh, right now. The thing that I'm most excited about though is local opportunities to follow up on these ideas. Okay, so sunfishes are an amazing example of convergent evolution in their mating system. You have these large sort of lex or social groups of male nests wh which are visited by females and indeed you have several species with alternative male ma mating tactics, sneakers, and in the bluegill you even have the satellite males, which are the third 
uh, mating morph that we see in our wrasses. So this is not actually that common in fishes to have three male mating morphs. It's pretty much a stunning opportunity to look at this using uh, something that's close at hand. Of course, salmon also have alternative male mating tactics. So I, um, it wouldn't be fair to avoid mentioning them at this point. I think there's a lot of potential opportunities even within steelhead. Okay. To summarize the projects I've told you about today, um, I'm interested in continuing comparative studies of life histories of diadromous fish. And I'm also interested in doing experimental work on steelhead. I'm definitely going to be doing some life history based conservation biology um, of data poor groupers, tunas, and sharks and rays. And then finally, I'm interested in expanding my research dimensions on life history, social selection, and diversification. Um, doing both theory and comparative work and potentially experimental work on local species. So with that, I think I'm going to wrap up and take any questions. Yes, hi. Okay, so the question is, what is driving the differences in the improvement in prediction um, between the species on the left and the species on the right? Well, so the answer is that um, that's just a subset of um, the eight species that we were fitting in that example. So um, depending on the details of each of the model fits, our, our confidence improved either tremendously or not at all. So the answer is I don't have a clear answer, but um, <laughs> it's kind of complicated. So. Yes. Okay, so the question is how we thought about multi-species modeling. So um, in the hierarchical Bayesian methods. So um, I kind of went over it quickly. Uh, so it's possible that the message was garbled. That's entirely likely. But yeah, we are actually doing multiple species modeling. So we're fitting the dynamics of related species at all together. So for example, the example that I showed you was model fits to eight species of, six species of skates, one ray, and one angel shark in the North Atlantic. So um, this question is a great one. It's how do pink salmon and chum salmon fit into my migration, my migration model? And this is a great question because pink and chum have a unique life history where they spend very little time in fresh water before they migrate to sea. So in fact, they actually have relatively large egg sizes because they need to have large eggs in order to get to a big enough size to migrate to sea that first season. So they're sort of unique among the Semmelparis lineages. And so that actually is, sets me up to tell you that my model is, is of the first Iteroparis salmon uh, that encounters a more difficult migration where maybe it, it it transitions to delayed semel parity. So it's just a, it's modeling the, that time when those species, when that ancestral salmon species diverged. And the data that we have today on pink and chum salmon reflect thousands of, or even longer, thousands of years of evolution. And, and once they've transitioned to this semel parous lifestyle, 
that kind of opened the door for them to, to evolve these new life histories that we don't see in Iroparis lineages. So I would actually hypothesize that Pink and Chum are doing something that isn't possible for Iroparis lineages because they can't evolve the egg sizes to be large enough. Um, does that make sense? Or would you like me to continue? <laughs> okay, I would love to talk more about this. <laughs> Yes. So the question is difficult migration. Am I referring to the gradient or something else about the migration? So, and the answer is that in this model, I don't discriminate. I'm doing something very abstract and inferring something indirect about the rate at which survival decreases as a function of the female's reproductive investment. But uh, in reality, I think, yeah, you're right on. We need to know something about what is it? Is it the length of time the female salmon has to spend? Some of these females swim 2,000 miles back to their natal habitat through Alaska, the Yukon, and into British Columbia. Um, or is it something about the elevational gradient since you know, Iroparis salmonids in Europe also sometimes make very long migrations. So maybe it's actually more like the ele elevational change. I, and the answer is I don't know, but I think it's really interesting. And I'd like to pursue further, yes. Yes, so I totally agree. So um, Derm Dermid is saying that within uh, lineages, we've got some populations that have shorter and some longer migrations in the same drainage, right? So I guess to put this in another way, we know that sockeye populations that return from the sea and spawn near the coast have uh, larger eggs than sockeye females that swim up the same main stem f further inland into British Columbia. Those ladies have smaller eggs. So I, I think we're agreeing. Yes? Yes. Thank you, you guys, these are great questions. So there's a deep connection between mating systems and life histories. So the evolution of sneaker males in Salmonids is a perfect example of this. So we see the evolution of mature par. There's salmon males that are this big, or maybe this big, and they're fully mature and able to fertilize offspring at this size. And they do this by sneaking in the nests of their anadromous uh, relatives their migratory relatives. So um, we know that par mature, they're the par that actually grow the best in the first year of life. So they're actually to able to achieve a size threshold in their first period of growth that allows them to mature early, avoid going to sea, and actually still get to fertilize eggs. So uh, I think that that's what I mean by that connection between life history and mating system. It's all about growth in fish. Um, I can elaborate more and more if you want me to. 